Good afternoon. I'm Brett Perlman, and welcome to the Center for Houston's Future po Leadership in the Post-Pandemic World webcast series. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the Center aims to convene business, government, and community stakeholders to address the most important issues in the greater Houston region through strategic planning and collaboration. And this year, we're running two webcast series, our Energy and Climate webcast series, and our series on leadership in the post-pandemic world. And what I'd like to do without further ado is introduce our two speakers today. Ann Chow is a community leader, historian, educator, and philanthropist who manages the Houston Asian American Archive at Rice University. She received her BA in Chinese Studies from Wellesley College and her MA and PhD in Modern Chinese History from Rice University. She's a member of various advisory boards and a board member of the Houston Endowment. And also joining us uh, and uh, conducting the uh, discussion today is Stephen Kleinberg, who many of, uh, of us are, are very well familiar with. Uh, he's a board member of the um, Center for Houston's Future and the founding director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research uh, at Rice University. And um, many of us are aware of his great book, Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America, which was released in 2020. Uh, through his work in the Kinder Houston Area Survey, he's tracked the economic outlook, demographic trends, experiences and patterns of local residents in the Houston area for more than 40 years. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College, the University of Paris and Harvard University. And um, we'll have time for Q&A after the discussion. So please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom app and submit your questions to, uh, to engage in the conversation. So Stephen and Ann, thank you very much for being with us. We're very excited to have you and to start this conversation and to hear a little bit about your thoughts uh, on, um, on Houston and uh, where we stand in the post-pandemic world. Uh, so Stephen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brent. What an honor to be here and especially an honor to be able to have this interview with, with Ann Chow and, and learn about how much she is contributing, what, what what's happening to the in the Asian community and to immigration and to the transformations of Houston as we prepare for the for for repositioning the city for success in the 21st century. So let's start and with just give us a little bit about your background and what brought you to Rice and 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 how you started this this remarkable archive of of the immigrant experience among the Asians in Houston and and how did it all come about? Thank you. Thank you, Steve, uh, for, for being my moderator. Thank you for the study of Center for Study uh, Houston Future. It's a great honor to be here today. Uh, my background, I was born in Taipei. My father uh, was actually the English translator to Chiang Kai-shek. And when he finished that job, he oh. was given a choice of all kinds of civic jobs that he, he wanted. He became, um, he chose to be a diplomat. So when I was 10 years old, he was assigned to Congo, Africa. This is the French Congo, not the Zaire we hear about today. It's a small country across the Congo River. Uh, so I was there for fifth and sixth grade. And then my father was sent to Washington, DC. And then after that, I finished my high school in Australia and then came to um, the United States for college. I met my husband, Albert, in um, college and then married. And then uh, his father's business in the petrochemical business. And eventually they took the business out of Taiwan um, and put most of it down in Texas. And that's why we are in Houston. Um, when I was at, when I first married Albert, I was trying to get my PhD in Chinese history, but he kept on moving, so I couldn't really finish any graduate degrees. Um, and we came to Houston. My children, my son went to Rice, and at Rice, I met Professor Richard Smith, who is a professor of Chinese history at the time. And I mentioned that I had somewhat some graduate classes in Chinese history, but never finished. So one thing led to another. He took me in as his graduate student, mm. and that's how I finished my PhD in two thousand and nine. Um, and it was funny that as I was going through the graduate program, I met a friend, uh, Judy Lee, whose father was the publisher of the first Chinese bilingual newspaper in Houston. And she said, my father's retired. We don't know what to do, all these newspapers. And meanwhile, I had a student mm -hmm. asking for internship. Um, and so we just put the student to mm -hmm. interview Mr. Lee, and then we took all of his papers into our uh, library special collection. And then out of that came this Houston Asian American archive, and now it's in its 11th year. Wow. And you, had, you, you weren't, at the beginning, you weren't planning to do this whole archive. That was yeah. one thing, and then, right, wow. So uh, 
how, how, what's it like? How many, how many interviews have you done? What's the story of the immigrant experience? And right. what do we learn from, 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 from those stories? Yeah, well, when we first interviewed Mr. Lee, we thought maybe it's a one-off thing. Um, he was he was actually a grocer who didn't want to be a grocer, but he had no other job opportunities when he immigrated to the United States. So eventually he sold his groceries business and bought a secondhand printing press and then started printing newspapers and any you know, programs, menus, restaurants given in order to survive. Um, so he did this completely as a labor of love. And so when we interviewed him in July, he was of course very happy to have his story told. Then he passed away in September, but he was uh, very proud that finally his story would be recorded for so charity. So then uh, that story um, became well received by the community. And then the word of mouth led to many people uh, suggesting us interviewing one person to another. And so that's why we expanded the effort. We hired Rice student interns. And then we also began with the idea that this, this should not be a Chinese American archive. It should be a Pan-Asian. So we interview Asians from East Asia to Southeast Asia to South Asia. So now we have about 400 plus interviews. Um, and we try to capture as many ethnicities of Asians in Houston as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole story of Houston, right? This was a biracial Southern city dominated by white men after the oil bust of 1982 uh, and with the change in the, in the laws of immigration, suddenly uh, the growth of Houston was coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Caribbean, and this biracial Southern cities become the most ethnically diverse city in the country. Right? And, and this is a, place where all the world's peoples, all the world's religions, all the world's ethnicities come together. And so what you've been looking at in terms of the, this remarkable community of Asians, when we first, when, back in, in, in uh, 1960, the total percentage of, of Asians in, in Harris County was 0.3%. They were all the G family, as we kind of jokingly talk about, but with some truth to it. And then the great growth of the Asians, and and so tell us what what what, are, what is some of what you've learned from those from the immigrant experience? How has it been going? What's been happening? What's your what's your take on where we are in the in the assimilation and development of the Asian community? Well, thank you. So we can start with the G family as a story that illustrates pretty much the development of the immigration. Um, experience. So I first met Harry G. Jr., a well-known immigration lawyer. He introduced me to many of his family members. Um, Gordon G. is one of them, and then yes. uh, and then uh, Jane G. is the other. Um, so we realized that Gordon is a cousin of Harry G. C. Jr., and Gordon's brother, Albert G., um, and Gordon's other brother, Wallace G., were the three brothers who were very, very successful in all of their enterprises. Albert G. was a well-known restaurateur. He created something called Oat Cantonese Cuisine, and he also was oh. such a charismatic and innovative person. He was elected a president of the Houston Restaurant Association, which is not an Asian concern. Um, his wife, Jane, was, I think, the first Chinese woman to attend Rice University. She came from a grocer family in San Antonio. Her father wanted to, her to become a doctor, so she was on a pre-med track. Then she fell in love with Albert and dropped out of Rice, and she told us she did not dare to go home for six months because her father was furious at her. But once he met Albert, all was forgiven. So Jane <laughs> became the president of the Women's Auxiliary of the Houston Restaurant Association, and she wrote all the speeches for Albert. Um, mm. Albert became very successful. He um, had a restaurant called Poly Asian next to the Shamrock Hotel on the main on Main Street, and uh -huh. Shamrock is where all the national entertainers, such as Bob Hope, um, Dale Evans, and Roy Rogers, would come and perform. Mm -hmm. And Albert G would entertain them for lunch, and then before you knew it, he was written up in the society pages. Um, mm -hmm. So, so this, and then so Albert started donating to political campaigns, to the John Connolly's campaign, to the Republican Party. To uh, so when Richard Nixon came down to Houston to visit Connolly, and Connolly invited them to his ranch for a big dinner, Jane and Albert were invited as well. And in our archive, there's a picture of Jane, Albert, Richard Nixon, Pat Nixon, John, and Nellie Connolly. So it, it's a success story in that way. Um, Albert's other distinction is that as uh, in the 1960, I think 61, the students of Texas Southern University decided they are going to walk, walk to Foley's run from counter and ask to be served. Right. And in that capacity, um, 
with, uh, and I think the chief of the police and the mayor of Houston decided they have to solve this problem peacefully, unlike other cities in the South. So with the cooperation of the advertising department of Foley's and the Houston, uh, mm -hmm. well, the, the John Jones, the head of Houston Post, I believe. Yes. They suppressed Jesse, the news. Jesse's open, nephew. Right. Jesse, uh, just. Exactly, John Jones. So they've suppressed the news of opening up the lunchroom counter. Um, the reporter we all know, our generation, Dan Rather, did not report this information for nine days. Um, but the room, lunchroom counter was opened uh, very successfully. Albridge's role was to uh, liaison with the head of the African American newspaper of Forward Times and then ask him to. Um, kind of broadcast information to the African American community that on such and such day, you can be served at Foley's lunchroom counter. And so Albert was the go between that helped the desegregation okay. of the lunchroom counter. Um, Albert's brother, Wallace, had a contract to open a cafeteria within the Houston Police Department. Albert's brother, Gordon, um, had a restaurant where political candidates for mayorship would go and have lunches. So at mm -hmm. the end of the election, um, Gordon G was offered um, any kind of favor that he would like the mayor to give him. And Gordon said, well, one of my cousins is a lawyer. He'd like to be in the city government. So I think he, his cousin became the first Asian American, Chinese American to be a judge in the city government. So this is an amazing story of networking, um, of using their ability to help each other and then succeed beyond what normal immigrants probably would expect yeah. to do. And, and that peaceful segregation, peaceful desegregation of, the, of accommodations that, that came, that's one of the great stories of Houston, Houston's history that sort of set the pattern for, we don't want to disrupt the business community and we don't want business to suffer. So we will find a way behind the scenes to make, to, to make these transitions successful and, and smooth. And, and, and bear in mind, they were operating under Jim Crow laws still in Houston in those days. Oh, absolutely. And, and so the Asian immigrants, neither being white nor being white, uh, black, they were kind of in a limbo. And so at times they will be subject to Jim Crow laws. They cannot live in a white neighborhood. Um, they are not able to be employed by white law firms, for instance, and they're not able to borrow money from white bankers. And yet at the same time, they can go to school with white people. Yeah, and, which, which blacks could not, of course. Right, right. So, the, so, 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 and so they're able to navigate very carefully, but uh, quite successfully in some instances. You know, I always feel like that's that's really one of the great the, the great contribution of Asians is that they, these are people of color, but also enormously successful professionals. So that there's 100% uh, American, but with deep ties still to their countries of origin. It's a tremendously important community to help build the multi-ethnic society of, the, of Houston in the 21st century. So uh, tell us something. How do you see that happening? How do you how do you see the evolution of, of the Asian experience in Houston as we go from first generation immigrants to second and third generation 100% American kids. Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your sense of, of where the immigration experience is for Asians in Houston today? Well, that, that's a great question. And I think um, the Asian population, Asian American is not a monolithic entity, right? So I think the so-called assimilation experience of the immigrants vary from group to group, from you know people to people. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at, so the first generation immigrants, the, our, our definition of first generation are people who are born overseas and who've come over here. Um, many of them are mostly preoccupied with survival um, and they enter this society at whatever level they came from. So this also touches on what is called the model and minority, right? Our perception is that all most Asians are highly successful, Everybody highly educated, and yet we forget that there are many, many um, groups of Asians who come in with very little, little education, little uh, resources of any kind, and little networking. So then right. there's that great disparity. So I think that the ones who are the most educated with the most resources assimilate very easily. Um, and then the so ones, the doctors, the lawyers, the, and the engineers, the, the, the um, and then and then so and they are at the, at they're highly sought after for their expertise, um, and therefore they really are very comfortably settled here. 
the ones with the least resources are the ones who stay in their own culture enclave, if you will. The Chinese stay in the Chinatown, the Vietnamese in their Vietnamese area, and many of them are still engaged in menial labor and they probably never learn English. They just stay in that enclave, but hopefully their children will be able to get education and then move off to a blue, uh, out of the blue collar um, job situation into a white collar. Um, and so some of the young, the second or third generation of the very successful group of Asian Americans, you see them moving away from the kind of strictures the parents would impose. Most Asian parents want their children to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, so, so that they can have a great living. Yes. But we are interviewing amazingly accomplished young second generation who've gone to Harvard and who've, who've gone, who've gone um, to great law school who actually have amazing jobs and yet they are taking a pause, some kind of a break to do something to give back to the community. Mm. Um, my favorite example would be Raj Salotra who had tried to run for city council, did not succeed, but today, you know, he, he, has a, he had a great uh, offer from a really prestigious law firm in Houston, but he finally turned it away and he's now doing a nonprofit called Momentum Education, which is basically concentrating on helping the underserved school students apply to college and then follow them to ensure that they succeed um, on the graduation end from college. Um, and we have other examples of second generation Asians who are really going into nonprofit or going to arts, which is, uh, you know, performance arts, which is another thing parents probably shake their heads at. Um, <laughs> we have young Asians who go into cooking. We have, we interviewed the chefs of Blood Brothers, three uh, second generation Chinese Americans who are doing Asian fusion barbecue. Um, so we see them really moving into the society almost as the other groups, right? The, the earlier white immigrants um, in, in a similar pattern. Right, and, and exactly right. And as I was saying earlier, just tremendous resources that they bring to, to the community and, 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 and also much more involvement now in politics compared to the first generation tend to stay away from politics and, and political issues. And, the second generation is saying, wait a minute, you know, there are problems here that we need to together address. And right, and, right have you seen that also? Yes. Um, I think the first generation's aversion to politics has to do with the reason why they left their own country. Most of them left because of political situations, um, whether they're escaping communism or some other kind of persecution. So they have a strong distrust of government and politics. And therefore they counsel their children to stay away from politics because they think that's not gonna bring any, any, good, any kind of good situation. But the children who grew up here understand that there is a democratic system here. Um, you know, whether or not we, we're, we're you know, criticizing um, the, the, the issues with this system, it is still Imperfect. probably, right. But this is still the best system as we can see immigrants vote with their feet. Um, and most of them are still coming despite all kinds of political rhetorics that we, we, we're hearing. Right. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, it is the great story of Houston, of course, is that, you know, we, we become this, we were talking to you earlier, this microcosm of all the world's peoples, all the world's ethnicities, all the world's religions gathered together in this one remarkable place. And it's just really fascinating to see. And, the, and again, the Asian community that is so critical because so many have come from very, from professional backgrounds. But then, as you were saying, 100% American kids, basically, fully assimilated into America, but also remaining connected to their countries of origin. The, you know, the, uh, the, all the, uh, Anise Parker once said that all the, all the primary languages of business spoken anywhere in the world are spoken in Houston by native speakers with global connections. And a big part of that is that as Houston becomes this microcosm of the world and the, and the gateway to the global marketplace, the, the role of the Asians becomes even more important. So where are we now and what's, what's happened with this, this discussion is supposed to be about the pandemic and what its consequences have been. How do you see what's happened to the Asian community as a consequence of this remarkable, strange, difficult year that we've all, all gone through? Well, of course, with the pandemic and then the political rhetoric calling this virus the China virus or Kung flu, um, the Asian American community, especially the East Asians, have suffered a huge backlash. We've seen an uptick in anti-Asian crime. And, you know, uh, so not only the Chinese were the targets, but anyone who looks like Chinese, whether Japanese, Koreans, or Vietnamese are now subject to attack. Um, it, it is horrible in that situation. However, the silver lining would be that it really galvanized the Asian American community. I think because of the 
not complacency, but this um, deliberate aversion to politics in the past of the older people, older generation, um, the younger generation, and now even the older generation realize if they do not, um, they get involved. Yeah. yeah, if they do not become more vocal and then you know open up their uh, their issues and they really make a stand in society, they will be overlooked and their issues will not be. Uh, uh, taken care of. So now we see a lot more grassroots organizations. There's lots and lots of AAPI organizations, whether it's for political activism or it is just for civic engagement. Um, and, and that is encouraging to see that people are coming out. And I think parents are giving blessing to their children. If you want to go into politics, go for it, because without a political representation, our future will not be secure. Um, the other interesting thing about assimilation is that the earlier generations, um, we hear that they do not want their children to speak their native language at home because they want them to completely become American as quickly as possible. Now you see these children embrace their cultural heritage. Very often it is in school, like rice, that they turn to their, you know, learning Chinese, learning Indian. Yes, learning yes. Because now they realize they want to continue kind of hold on to some of the culture. So now it is a matter of selective assimilation. Um, they embrace what is wonderful in this society, but then they also want to contain, retain some of what they learn. And so that is kind of played out in, in food. For instance, you have a uh, fusion cuisine of every kind, right? And you have something mm -hmm. called bubble tea, which is a Asian snack drink that has now become almost mainstream. And I think all the rice students know what bubble tea is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you see in, in fashion design, you see in art, uh, now now it's almost hard to say what is Asian art versus what is contemporary art because now you have a fusion of different elements um, and all of that is happening. So it's really an interesting time to watch the development of, of the uh, immigrant experience. Absolutely. And that's that process of building this multi-ethnic world that is new, that has never existed anywhere in the world before a microcosm of all the world's peoples. And so, in, especially in the arts, you see this, this remarkable sort of growth of, of new, new f f forms and new, new ideas and new structures that come from that future. And the other piece of that, of course, is Asians, even more than the other communities, are falling in love with non-Asians, marrying and making multiracial babies. Right? The, something like one third of all, marry, of all marriages involving an Asian in the last few years, one third involved a non-Asian. 28% of all marriages involving a Latino involve a non-Latino. And you can see this sort of gro growth of a, of a new world where ethnicity becomes less a defining thing than, than class and connections and, and, and talents and, and, and values. So it's been, it's, it's, it's a really maybe the most interesting place to be is Houston, Texas, these days, I think. <laughs> so uh, what else? Uh, so well, I can give you a few more stories of immigrants. So okay. <laughs> biggest of, of Bihima, and something we're really studying because it's such an interesting phenomenon. Um, in the Indian community, for instance, we have we studied an organization called Daya, which is a women's shelter. Well, they don't call them a shelter; they call them women's center. And it began with the wife of an Indian doctor who has heard about issues in the Indian community, but because Indians are considered a model minority. They do not want to air their dirty laundry in public. Mm. So, and she was uh, she was trained as a social worker in India, and she came here into Houston, and she also trained again at the Fort Bend Women's Center. So she knows how to deal with these situations. Um, she and the wives of the Indian doctors have a club called you know, the, wife, the Club of the Wives of Doctors. And among themselves, they were talking, we should do something because we hear you know, XYZ has this problem. But nothing was done until I think 1973, or I may be off on a year, when they heard this horrific story, this Indian woman, who killed her husband, her three children, and set the house on fire, and then killed herself because she had been abused throughout her married life. Um, her neighbors were shocked because she never confided in anyone, even though she would listen to other people's troubles. So at that point, um, the, the person we interviewed, Lakshmi Paramisaran, started giving out her, oh, card, yes. her business card, her, her phone number, to all her friends and saying, if you hear something, let us know. And that's how they began this organization called Daya, which is, um, which means compassion in Sanskrit. And today it's grown into a very big organization with a million plus dollar budget. And they feel something like 4,000 phone calls a year. Um, they had begun with um, taking women out of an abusive situation 
giving her counsel, um, for instance, English lessons, driving lessons, you know, put her and her child in a safe house, and then also go with her to court to sue her, the, the abuser, usually her husband. Um, and that has continued. And it, we have interviewed victim, uh, clients of Daya, and it's amazing the kind of things they do. And, and the reason why Daya is... Get- Yes, is to get them out. And the, the reason why Daya is necessary that um, Asian women who may not even speak English well do not comfortable going to something like women's shelter in the women's center here in Houston because the language is different, the food is different, the religion, the culture is different, and they just don't feel they can confide in them. And that's why these culture specific institutions are also necessary within the Asian American community to help themselves. Especially because these are still immigrant communities with, that are not U.S. born, but still, yeah. And that whole uh, that that again the majority the the model minority myth that says everyone's doing fine and and Asians don't want to draw attention to themselves and and so you've got these serious problems that have been languishing and 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 now beginning to be really accepted and developed and recognized. We're all in this together and and. Uh, uh, Breaking through some of the, the some of the, those stereotypes that prevented us from from addressing these issues successfully. So there's another interesting phenomenon. Um, recently, I um, I gave a lecture to Banyak um, Institute about religion and immigrants, and so we started looking at the Christian churches that the Chinese. I, I focus on the Chinese, um, even though I know the Korean population has a very vibrant Christian community. We look at the Christian churches. Um, the first Chinese Baptist church, the first Chinese church, which is the Chinese Baptist church, was really started with help of the Houston Baptist Church. I think it was the second Baptist church that helped. Um, so at the beginning, when the Houston, uh, the American Baptist Church ladies noticed that the children of the grocers were not really getting out because they, the, cho- the children had to work in the grocery stores so that usually they can only socialize when the grocery stores are closed. So the ladies of the Houston Baptist Church would tell, ask the parents, could they bring these children into their churches, give them English lessons or social hours. And then from that mm-hmm. beginning, the basement of the Houston Baptist Church grew the seed for the first Chinese Baptist Church. Um, and this is in the 1950s. And now this church is, in, I think, in the memorial area after several moves. And then this church spawned many different churches. And I think in the language of the church, it's called planting. Um, so the Houston Baptist Church planted the Houston Chinese Church. Planting, yes. Planted the Western, the West Chinese Church. And then that planted churches in Clear Lake, right. um, Lubbock, Woodland, you name it. And so it's amazing the growth of these churches. And the Chinese immigrants in China may not be Christians, but they come to this country and they found this Christian church has the best organized, welcoming system, right? They not only welcome you as a neighbor, they invite you to social hours, and then they, of course, suggest you take Bible lessons, but then they offer other things. They, um, for instance, in New York Chinatown, their churches offer food, especially many of the uh, attendees are illegal, so they give them food, shelter, job opportunities, um, and then for here, they give them English lessons, uh, all kinds of connections to housing opportunities. So now this is a huge community. And I know that on Rice campus, we have a very vibrant student um, Christian fellowship organization. Yeah, and then Mm -hmm. the last thing is that the second generation has grown up. So the first generation needed to stay in Chinese churches because they can't speak English. The second generation speaks English. They may not go back to parents' church, but those who go back, the church is asking them to go back to China and proselytize. So now we have a cycle. It's an amazing (laughs) phenomenon that's, that's, it's not quite large yet, but it is, this is, we talk to Catholic churches, we talk to Christian churches, they're hoping the second generation would be the evangelists to go back and proselytize in China. In China, it helped develop the Christian communities in China. And then you've got, of course, the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims that are all part of this religious phenomenon that's uh, coming together of all the, all the world's religions. You know, it's just, it's uh, what, a, what a wonderful sort of time you've had in terms of, of broadening our, our understanding and our sensitivity to, to, the, to these questions. So where are we going? How well are we doing? What's happening in Houston? What's, uh, you know, there's still, there's, we're talking about, you know, the model minority myth, we're talking about, uh, lots of Anglo's who are resentful of, of these changes. 
lots of Asians who are feeling deeply worried about the Asian the hate, the hate crimes that are developing. Where are we overall? What's, what's your assessment of? of uh, well, my assessment is that the antagonism is really um, anecdotal, right? It, it, I think person-to-person -person relationship is still very, very good. Um, the Chinese and the, most all Asians, I would say, are still very optimistic about their future in this country. Um, they, they abhor the, what is happening, especially when a lot of this sentiment is kind of fanned by the political rhetoric several years ago. Um, they recognize that if they do not stand up for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, nothing's gonna happen. So they are becoming more proactive, not only by organizing civic organizations to help themselves, but by being more proactive to giving back to this community. Um, so we have interviewed Korean Americans who say, well, during the pandemic, we actually produced lots of masks and distributed them to our neighborhood organizations that are not Asian. Not just uh, Asians. Not just Asians. And right. there is a Buddhist organization called um, a Tsuji, a Compassionate Buddha, where they actually, at any a hurricane or tornado flooding um, this kind of a drastic situation, they immediately contact the Red Cross and then go and help the community that will be the least um, tapped by Red Cross. So that for instance, when Harvey hit, they didn't go to the large cities. They went to the tiny Texas towns where they knew that Red Cross probably wouldn't be able to reach um, fast. And then they go there, they assess their needs and they start distributing phone debit cards, food, uh, you know, HEB cards, or, and then give them blankets and clothes. And then they'll go back a few late, weeks later to check on them. So there is, a, and this um, society is famous all over the world. And basically it started in Taiwan, it went on to mainland China. Now it's all over the world for helping people in times of need. And so this is the kind of opportunities where Asian Americans think that they can be visible, but also be a positive force for society. Um, so I think that it is still a very optimistic feeling among the Asian American communities. Um, they are even with them, even with all of the, the the hate crimes. Yeah, I think they're they're, they're more careful, right? They they ask for more police in Chinatown, for instance. They look around before they go somewhere dangerous. But I think they are still happy to be here. You don't hear many people go back. Um, it is, but I have talked to several physicians in the medical community where the FBI is now investigating them because of this so-called China initiative where they're trying to root out potential spying activities by professionals. And so that mm. situation has led to a lot of doctors being extremely careful and that we know, I know that several doctors who were investigated um, whether or not they're innocent have now just gone back to China. Um, as a result. So, so it's, it's an uneven terrain. It's a, this is a big change and a big transformation. And it, it, it's, it's not going to happen easily. But the, but the other thing, of course, is that younger Anglos are just so much more comfortable with all of this and so much more likely to have close personal friends. So, I mean, you just watch in, at Rice now, which is so, so has become, when I first came to Rice, of course, it was it was 80% Anglo, it was 90% Anglo, 80% Texan. And now, of course, uh, it's something like 45% Anglo in a in world that is, and, you, and just these friendships that develop and the, and the, 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 the inevitability almost of you know, this sense of where we're heading is, is, is there's no way to, to stop this process of moving us toward, a, toward really being the first truly my, uh, microcosm of, of all the world's ethnicities. I'd like to think that diversity is a good thing. Um, yeah. If you think about the contribution that Asian Americans have uh, made to this society, you would say, for instance, I think you, you know better than I do, that 60% of those Asian American immigrants who are 25 and above have a bachelor's degree or if a higher educational degree so that they bring to the state an intellectual element Right, they've, they've risen the, the percentage of um, highly educated people. You have about 51,000 um, Asian owned businesses that hire about half a million people in the state of Texas and they pretty much pay like $14 billion of tax. I, I got this information from the Texas Demographic Center. Um, okay. you know, so, so financially, I think intellectually, the Asian American immigration is 
contributing well to the state of Texas. And I also would say culturally, it is fun to have more different kinds of food and restaurants to go to. Um, it is wonderful fun. music and dances and, and yes. dance art. We had we interviewed many many Filipino Asian American artists who do vibrant work, and they are shown in different galleries in town. Um, and then there, as you say, dancers. Uh, maybe not so much in the opera and the theater world, but I think there are now there are inroads into Asian American performances. So I think it just makes the state a richer state, and or maybe a more fun place to be. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Great. Well, you've been a tremendous uh, source of of bringing together of of that of that of the Asian experience in, in Houston. And we're all very grateful to you. Shall I, shall I open it up to questions uh, outside of me? Is there yeah, I can, I can, um, I've been fielding a couple questions, uh, for, and you have a ton uh, of questions, so um, uh, people who have uh, questions, uh, still have questions, put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, so um, one, one uh, question is, as we've seen um, this growth and then immigration policy changing, uh, even for legal immigrants, um, and then Asian uh, uh, refugee resettlement slowing to a halt, uh, how, how do you see the growth um, in, in the Asian American community? Do you see it declining? Is is are are, are people now looking to go to um, uh, to Canada, to Australia, to other companies and the other countries? And what do you see the impact? If so, what is the impact of that going to be uh, on on the U.S. and on the Eastern region? So maybe that's a, a, for Anne a question first, and then Steve, I know you're going to have some perspectives on that as well. Yeah, um, I'm. I don't have the numbers for immigrants. Uh, of you know, with how many Chinese people are able to come in. I do hear that it is much more difficult, um, and that many are not coming to the United States because, it, especially college students who are not able to get their visa to come mm -hmm. to the states and and go to school. That is a big concern. Um, if this trend continues, and I hope that the Biden administration will reverse some of that. If this trend continues, it is a loss. It is a loss for America in terms of its intellectual power you know, that, that they could potentially bring. Um, and as mentioned, for instance, earlier with Stephen, that one of the physicians who was, who was investigated um, at the medical center eventually returned to China immediately. She was hired to become the director of an institute there. So that we're basically losing our well, you know, really precisely trained um, experts and then we just kind of send them back to, to China, which is really a, a, a very concerning issue. And I think Stephen probably can add more. Right, I mean, it's just such, such a uh, counterproductive effort. I mean, it's just hurting us more than it's hurting anybody else. And we, again, when you think that, that Anglos are disproportionately older folks and the young people are disproportionately non-Anglo, that's, that's our future. And, that's, and, and we need immigrants, we need all the, all that energy, all the things that, that Anne has been showing us is, is uh, and especially because so many of the Asians, as you were saying, come from ed educational income backgrounds that are far superior to the average Anglo background. Yeah. We need to find ways to, to enhance the, the great, I mean, the great strength of Houston and America, especially Houston is assimilation, is, is our openness to new people and our recognition that all of us come from somewhere else and have come to Houston to make, it, make our new home. That's a critical, uh, part of our strength. And it's just crazy to, to allow the, the, the number of refugees and, and immigrants to, to, to be cut back at a time when, when the, the need, for, need for, the, for those talents are greater than ever. Yeah. So, so let's just drill down on this idea of um, this idea of moving from diversity to inclusivity. I think we're in this moment now <clears throat> where uh, there's been a recognition that, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a, a value that I think has is now broadly shared um, across the community. And I know in the work we're doing, the work the Greater Houston Partnership is doing, there's been an enhanced focus on this. So just are, what are the, some of the specific areas uh, where you see barriers or ceilings for uh, the Asian American community? Where are the areas that um, you see struggle and are these different from, from other communities? Um, how, how are they similar? How are they different? So, um, you know, are there things that are unique to this community versus um, other other communities uh, in Houston? And do you want to take a cut at that first? Um, I think in the job job market, right? That's where uh, the issue of injustice or the glass ceiling 
is always a big concern. And we, when we interview the, the first generation immigrants, we always include a question. You know, the, the interviewee may be the, a woman physician. We'll say, well, if you're an Asian woman physician in the medical world, did you re encounter any discrimination? We always, and, and invariably everyone has a discrimination story. Um, so I think it is not overt as much. It's not like in the past when I interviewed Bob G, as uh, Brett, you know him, um, he said when he graduated from UT Law School, uh, his father, Wallace, who is very friend, friends with lots of big lawyers in town, these law firms told his father, you know, we can't even hire your son because he's Chinese. So in those who is very overt. Today, not so overt. Um, mm. The decisions that are made to promote one person over another are often very opaque. Um, you know, very often it is not because the person happens to be a particular race, but then other situations where there is, it is because that person's race. So there's that glass ceiling. Um, among the Chinese Americans, we compare ourselves to the Indian Americans. And then the Chinese Americans often feel, well, in, in corporate situations, the Indian American manages to um, be promoted faster than the Chinese American. Um, it is an anecdotal observation. I cannot be you know, held liable for statistical analysis on this. However, the, conclu the, the, the conclusion among the Chinese American would be, well, first of all, Chinese is, English is not their first language. And therefore they do not have the facility with language that the Indian Americans mm. may have. Um, if we say that, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of socializing in a corporate world is a, around the water cooler, for instance, is to discuss sports statistics. Well, the Chinese immigrants are not good at either one. And maybe that's the reason why they're not well appreciated. But you know, this is all personal observations. Um, yeah. But, but so, so much of this creation today will be very, very subtle. Um, it is also hard to pinpoint. Um, but of course, as we know, we've read these cases at you know um, Asian students applying to college, whether or not they were discriminated against because they were considered mechanical, not very leadership quality, or, or is it because there are just too many of them? I mean, we don't know. So, so now the discrimination is very, very subtle. I see. Steve, any thoughts on that? On you know when 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 you think about Houston, um, what what are the things that we need to do as a as a city and as a region to start thinking about? Um, you know, being a little bit more explicit on our policies or the way we think about in inclusivity. What, what would you recommend? What are things we ought to be doing? Right. Well, it's not, I mean, that's not surprising that there are stereotypes and expectations. And we're used to, when you think of who, who looks like a corporate leader, it's, it tends to be an older, distinguished Anglo kind of, uh, and, and second generation U.S. born uh, uh, Asians are, Fluent in English, obviously, 100% American, and, and encounter less of that. Of that, it's a part of being alive at a time of dramatic change, and people are are seeing the coming with different stereotypes and expectations, and and again, why younger Anglo's are much more comfortable with all of this, and much less uh, prepared to to discriminate in that same way as as older Anglo's, and it's not a deliberate discrimination. It's just a sense of what am I used to? What do I expect? What do what, what, who looks the part? Uh, and, and again, it just seems to me that that's an inevitable accompaniment of, of being living at a time of such dramatic change. And, and there's a difference between first generation immigrants and the experiences that they have and US born second generation coming from upper middle class backgrounds, making even uh, going even further in education than their parents did here in the United States. And, and prepared for, for leadership positions in a way that is just, uh, I think, inevitable. I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to sound too Pollyannish, but there's an inevitable process of transformation that's, that's underway here. That, and, and the resistance is understandable, but I say no force in the world will stop, stop this, this demographic transformation. Um, one of the things, Anne, you've been talking about, and you, you mentioned it, is this... Um, idea of the um, a model, um, uh, model, uh, met, what, what, how did you say it? The model, um, uh, model, model, the, the model, yeah, model minority. So, so how do we start, how do we break that down? How do we start to think about defining um, these different um, identities uh, in the Asian community? And, and how, how, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, but that's a very good question. Um, the first thing to remember is that Asian American is not one monolithic group. 
um, you know, when you look at API, I think there are like 50 countries that belong to the API regional um, district and also probably 100 languages. And then so every different um, Asian American Pacific Islander country has a different history and a different culture. And those, the, those immigrants who come into this country come for very different reasons. And they came with very different resources and preparation. So once you realize that, then you start looking at the different groups and then you realize, well, they all have different challenges. Um, they all have different successes. Um, so that's one thing. So I think more exposure to the different kind of Asian Americans will familiarize the community, humanize them, do not, not consider them other people. And then finally understand they all have different challenges. And I think Stephen earlier um, mentioned that who looks right, who looks the part, right? Yeah. And that often dictates our choices of people. So if you look at the entertainment industry, the earlier roles assigned to Asian actors would be like Fu Manchu or Susie Wong, right? These are very stereotypical Asian characters. And then, um, and then as you, during the maybe 1960s and 70s, there were very few Asian actors, but then they would be policemen or some kind of sleazy character. But today you see Asian Americans being the, the main actors in a particular show. Um, the reason why Crazy Rich Asian became such a popular movie mm -hmm. is that for the Asian community, at last they're no longer seen as these poor people who have no resources. These are super wealthy people who, you know, they were stereotypical, they were caricatures, but it's a refreshing way to look at Asians. Um, so all of that is just getting more out there, getting more exposed to Asians, having Asians be more exposed, um, and that would help. Yeah. And the other, the other side of that is, is uh, not all Asians are doing well, as you, as you reminded us, especially the Vietnamese who came in the two ways. The first wave were the were the backers of the American government that got out in an ignominious uh, 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 <laughs> the uh, going up on the roofs and, and hopping onto the helicopters and getting and the second the second were the were the Vietnamese boat people the survivors of the killing fields of Cambodia and and in Houston many Vietnamese are facing all kinds of difficulty unlikely to receive help in a language they can understand from a community that thinks all the Asians are doing great. So it is very important to remind us of the diversity and variety of the 27 different cultures and, and, and very different experiences, as you were saying, that, that, that uh, Asians represent as, as, you know, a microcosm of a massive percentage of the world's population are, are Asian. So yeah. it's a good thing to remind us of, of the need to disaggregate and to look carefully at, at each of the human beings and, and, and what they're facing and what we can do to help. Yeah. Well, we have a really interesting question, and it kind of blends this idea of the hate crimes and the um, communications between generations. And and you may or may not have a, a view on this, but the evo this, the question is about the evolution of the community's openness to health, uh, mental health resources, and what's mm -hmm. available. I know I know this is an area that we've been looking at at the center uh, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, the need to have enhanced, uh, you know, basically access to mental health resources. Is that something that you see, and um, and how open is the community, uh, various parts of the community uh, to taking advantage of those services? What needs to be done uh, in the post-pandemic world in, in, in that area, do you think? Um, because of this mono-minority myth, a lot of Asians, especially second generation, are expected to perform at an excellent level academically and every other way. That is tremendous pressure on these kids. And then so many of them develop highly stressful situations. But then the other part of model minority myth is that the parents think, well, you know, it is embarrassing for my family to have a member go to seek psychiatric or psychological counseling. And so they do not encourage their children to seek a mental um, health care. Um, they, usually they turn to family members or to friends, but those are not professionals. So that is a big impediment of having parents allowing children to go out and seek help. Then the other side of that is that there aren't enough Asian American mental health providers. Um, I recently did a talk at Texas Children's for the fellows of psychology. And they were wondering who are the people out there who are treating Asian American population? We really had to go high and low seeking every, you know, people in Clear Lake, people everywhere. There weren't that many people. 
Um, so there's a huge need out there. And um, I think that maybe if we can blow apart the model minority myth and then just really tell the people when you have a mental issue, you really need to go and seek help. I mean, I think it's just talking up more, um, having people be more aware that there, there's no, the model minority is a big myth and there are a lot of people out there suffering. Um, yeah. Um, I want to turn the conversation a little bit to um, kind of the world, um, global politics. And uh, we've seen the rise of uh, China and, um, and, and now, you know, concerns about where the, um, uh, where the Chinese, Chinese um, politics are going and the impact of that on the situation in, um, in Hong Kong. Um, how do you think that's going to affect um, immigration and in particular immigration to Houston, uh, you know, perhaps versus other parts of the globe? So how is the change and, uh, you know, the, the um, geopolitics starting to affect uh, this community? Um, okay. Well, I know that the situation is very tense between the U.S. and China. Um, and I know that the, the current government in China is very expensive in the sense that they are out there to um, strike a pose of being the super, I mean, they're, they're aspiring to the superpower position. Um, they are much more authoritarian than the previous administrations. And then, you know, as we know, the crackdown in uh, with the Uyghurs and then the, uh, um, the crackdown in Hong Kong. So they are really brooking no opposition. Um, this is a regime that took everyone by surprise. We all thought that Xi Jinping himself, the son of a politician who suffered, he would have a much more open-minded um, system of governance. It, it's not happening. And the US, of course, in order to counter this position is also putting up quite a bit of a uh, opposition resistance. So, so the situation is not pretty right now, if I can say, it's, it's quite dangerous. Um, I am not sure the US immigration policy is going to become even stricter because it had become quite strict under the Trump administration. Um, and it is more difficult, I think, for Chinese immigrants to come into this country and therefore coming to Houston. Um, but I'm not an immigration lawyer, so I cannot predict what is happening or what will be happening um, in the next few years. Yeah. Steve, any thoughts on that, on the, how, how the global uh, geopolitics are playing out and their impact on how, uh, how it might affect Houston. Yeah, well, it's, I'm going to share Ann's sort of question, but we don't know how it's going to, going to work out because the other piece of it, of course, is that we have to cooperate with the Chinese if we're going to deal with global warming and with the energy transition that is underway. We all understand how critical that is because we're all suffering under the consequences of, 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 of global warming. So, so we need to cooperate as well as compete. And I think, I think there, you know, there's some hope there that we can find a modus vivendi that will enable us to, to share this planet and to work together to, to protect it, that, that may, may uh, help us as we go forward. But we obviously have to have comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, it's just just crazy how, how inadequate has been our, our efforts to deal with immigration and to balance the forces that we're dealing with. And, and with some, you know, that's, that I think is the key issue on the agenda in general is, is how do we how do we regulate the immigration so that we can bring people in who, who need to be allowed in and, and still give a conf confidence that we have control of the borders? Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point because it seems like, you know, we know it's, it's like a lot of these intractable problems. We sort of know what the answer is, but we don't know how to get there. Right, right. Exactly. And um, I, I don't know if you guys have a perspective. How do, how do we break the logjam uh, that we have on immigration reform right now? Do you have any um, words of advice? I mean, we've been looking at this at the center for many years and, um, you know, I think we're somewhat discouraged right now. We thought that there might be an opportunity and yet we, we see, um, we, we don't see anything moving forward. Um, how should we be thinking about, uh, you know, reaching some sort of grand compromise on, on immigration reform? Any thoughts on that? And maybe go first on that one. Wow. Um, I know, I know <laughs> Big question. Yeah, Charles Foster and Stan Merrick and that group has been pushing for Texans for sensible immigration reform for years. They've gone to the White House, they've lobbied, and I think there's just so much political opposition um, for entrenched interest that I, I'm not sure how we can overcome this situation. I'm pretty pessimistic on that, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Steve, any thoughts? I'm a little more optimistic. I think I think there's you know there's a the, the DACA situation, for example. I mean, these are these are hundred percent American kids. They know have no other home. They've done everything that we asked of them. They went to they graduated from high school. They served in the military. They went to college, and they're locked out of anything because they're they're in limbo. They have no no place in America, which is the only home they know. That's that's a ripe fruit that we've had trouble dealing with, and it's, but, but it's clearly a step toward that, that we, ought, we ought to be able to agree on. We ought to be able to find a way to, to make, to, to just regularize that, that the status of those DACA kids. And that can begin to move us toward a, a more comprehensive and rational immigration reform. Meanwhile, the plan, the idea and idiom and taxum, which is Stan Merrick's thing is, that's just so logical and so much, you know, they're doing this work, let's make them pay taxes and let's, let's know who they are in this country and, 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 and know that we need, we need the work that, that, that these immigrants are bringing. And they've been here for 20, 30 years in this limbo status that is just un, unacceptable in a country like the United States. And so I, so I, I think that, we may be moving toward in, in that direction. We've got a new regime in, in, in Washington that is much more understanding of these issues than we saw before. So, but it's going to be tough. And Anna's right. It's, 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 you know, there's reasons for pessimism. It's been a long time and, and very difficult to, to, to manage. But, but the logic of, of doing something is just so powerful, it seems to me. Yeah, I'll just put a plug in. We are, will have an event at the Baker Institute on November the 4th where mm. we're going to bring, um, a lot of these issues together and hopefully have a, a, a community-wide discussion yes. with the idea of perhaps bringing the business community into the mix more so that we can have uh, perhaps another voice that is um, that seems to be absent from some of these discussions that could make a, make a difference. So, so stay tuned, we'll be uh, uh, announcing that very shortly. We just have a couple minutes to go and I wanna zoom out because I know both of you have perspectives and Ann, uh, you're on the board of the Houston Endowment and we're gonna have Ann Stern as um, uh, on one of our next um, uh, of these webcasts. And um, how do we think about the role of uh, philanthropy, you know, in, as a force in Houston? Um, and, you know, what, what, where do you see, the, where do you see uh, the philanthropic community to weighing in on this, some of these problems? Or, or, or how do you see that as a, as a potential um, avenue for addressing some of the things we've been talking about today? I think Houston has one of the most philanthropic communities in this country. People are generous, um, they're willing, they're civic minded and they're willing to roll up their sleeves and, and do something. Um, at the endowment, um, I was very privileged to see so many different organizations and every month, you know, the, the, the program offices field, you know, hundreds of applications for things and most of really, really, uh, important issues to address. So I think under our new, uh, she's not new anymore, but under Ann Stern's leadership, she's able to not only leverage the actual resources of the endowment, but also use the reputation and the collaborative uh, energy that Houston Endowment can bring to bring many different foundations together to pull together the resources, expertise, not to overlap each other, but then together focus on several big issues. One of them she'll probably talk about, I'm sure she'll talk about the Good Reason Houston on the educational front. Um, there's also efforts on civic engagement, getting uh, people to be more politically conscious. Um, there are other social justice issues, for instance, improving parks and waterways so that everyone can enjoy nature and not just having people who belong to certain private organizations enjoy them. Um, also, this endowment is trying to support the mid-size arts organizations to um, allow them to survive without having a lot of resources behind them. And I think that um, Houston Endowment, at, the, at least, is very focused on Houston area well-being. And the effort is to make the city a much more vibrant city. Good. Steve, I know this has been a topic in the, um, in the survey from time to time. Are there any conclusions that you have? in terms of the role of uh, philanthropic organizations. Well, as Dan says, this is one of the great strengths of Houston is the, is the amount of philanthropic uh, nonprofit organizations that are operating. But, uh, you know, it's, we need much more. And I, I, I find myself saying every church in the city ought to be providing preschool and after school programs. Every business ought to adopt the school. 
And we ought to become a learning society. We ought to make in investments that, that draw on all of the resources that we have, and not just the big uh, philanthropic enterprises, but also the smaller, more local, more focused efforts on the part of ordinary Houstonians across the board and, and become, uh, I mean, the great strength of Houston, I think, is the quality of people who are here and the belief that people have in the city and the, and the, it, the desire to make the city successful, especially as we position ourselves as, as a, at the forefront of what's happening across all of America, nowhere more clearly seen than in Houston. So, so it's, it's a, we, we need all kinds of, of philanthropic and we need more governmental programs and we, we need to spend more money on education. Houston and Texas are at the bottom in spending on education at a time when the good blue collar jobs have disappeared and, and the growing gap between which and poor is predicated above all else on access to quality education opportunities that all of us who have been successful in the city need to find a way to help provide. So we're doing well. Uh, I worry as I get older that we're not doing enough and it's taking too long. And so one example is that we, we care deeply about preschool education. Houston is behind San Antonio and behind Dallas. In, in, the, in the percentage of poor kids who have access to quality preschool education. Houston isn't doing it yet. And so it's a question of, can we harness these resources? Can we build on, on what we've been doing well and, and do more of it and involve more people in the process of building a city that can be a model for the rest of the country? Well, well, thank to both of you. This has been a really great discussion and you've left us with, I think that you know, one uh, vision that we can share is Houston. Can Houston become the model for the 21st century? And Steve, your work has been amazing in, in putting out that, that view. And Anne, thank you for all the work you're doing in helping to define not only the past uh, through the archive, but, you know, views on how this is evolving. Uh, so I think the resource that you brought to the table is an amazing one. Uh, I just want to thank our audience for, for being, um, uh, contributing all their questions and for your interest. Uh, we have another webcast next week on our energy and climate uh, series, uh, if you're interested, on Tuesday at 5 o'clock. Uh, and we'll be uh, hosting um, uh, Boston University's Peter Fox Penner, who is an expert on uh, decarbonization. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, the role that the electric grid plays uh, in, in moving towards uh, a low-carbon economy. And we'll be talking a little bit about the... Um, uh, the February blackout and what we can do to address that problem. So uh, if you're interested in that, I think uh, the, uh, we'll put the, um, uh, the link in the chat and I know that it's on our website as well. So hopefully you can tune into that and thank you both of you for such a wonderful uh, conversation. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with the, uh, with the series is really bring uh, thought leaders like you guys to the table to really have a, a good discussion on the issue. And thank you all for participating in what's been a, a marvelous hour. Uh, very good, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Take care. Thank, thank you, everybody. Great to be with Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.